mailboxes full of fraudulent unemployment claims as the state tries to flag them all before criminals can get to the money. A great next question from you. Why doesn't the state hire people who are unemployed to staff the overworked unemployment phone lines? A serious number of long-term care workers wanted no part of the COVID vaccine as new cases of the virus in Colorado stopped declining. It's not great news. And a fashion statement on vaccination day that has some real history. That's next. Colorado's beleaguered unemployment system is really trying to do two crucial things at one time. Get money to hundreds of thousands of Coloradans who need it while fending off an enormous amount of fraud from people who should not get the money. We just heard from a new homeowner whose mailbox was full of unemployment debit cards for random people who don't live at that place. When our Marshal Zellinger started asking questions about this, he found out the state had already flagged all of that as fraud because of a new computer system. No, no mail today yet. An empty mailbox is almost a pleasant surprise compared to what Tim and Linda Stewart have been getting delivered to their new townhome. When I got done with closing, I came over here to check the mail and open the mailbox and it was jammed full. Not jammed full of welcome to the neighborhood letters and coupons. These are all different names. Jammed full of unemployment debit cards for a dozen different people, all addressed to the Stewart's new home. They got postmarks from the 29th of January through uh, the 23rd, I think, of um, February. This morning, I just decided to take it in my own hands, and I went and um, got on the website and entered in the names and the addresses. But even before Linda reported the fraud on behalf of the people who probably didn't know their names were being used, the state's unemployment office already knew. The biggest benefit of launching My UI Plus was within the fraud detection and prevention sphere. Daniel Chase is the chief of staff for the state's Department of Labor and Employment, the department that has taken flack for the payment delays caused by the new My UI Plus computer system. The same computer system that did what the old computer system could not flag these claims for fraud simply because so many were filed under different names at the same address. It will automatically set a payment hold on the claim and that can't be released until they verify their identity with us, uh, which the fraudster wouldn't be able to do. So how does the fraud work anyway? If the debit card is delivered, that means the fraudster could go online to the account they created under someone else's name and switch the payment method from the debit card to a direct deposit. Since these were flagged for fraud, that can't happen. But it also means the people whose names appear on these envelopes may never know their names were used in a fraudulent way. These individuals would not know that their identities have been compromised and they need to take protections um, to, to protect their own identities. And for now, that list is not growing. <laughs> The stewards just checked their mail an hour ago. No new debit cards. If you see an unemployment claim in your mailbox for someone else, report it as fraud for that person. Since the 12 people whose names showed up in the Stewart's mailbox have no idea this was happening, I tried to reach out to those 12 through phone numbers to try to find. Since the Department of Labor and, Unemploy and Employment they don't have true information for those people. So these people have no idea. You have to alert the credit bureaus. You may be the victim of identity theft, Kyle. Marshall, how, do, how does the state figure out what's fraud and what's not when it's all coming in so quickly? Well, this new computer system has 50 different indicators. I didn't get a list of all 50, but multiple names at the same address is one flag that would alert uh, CDLE. Another would be different IP addresses making claims for the same person. All right. And out of the box, in the box, live report from Marshall Zellinger. Thank you, sir. Well, we thought that we had, oh, he closed, he closed the door. We thought that we had heard every possible complaint about the state's unemployment system. You know, people not getting payments when they're expecting them, issues with the call center, people receiving notices that they've applied for unemployment when they still have their job. Well, now we heard from somebody who experienced two simultaneous issues, both from the employee end and the employer end. The one that I got at home was on Friday, and then when I came to work on Monday, I received a letter also from the Colorado Department of Labor informing me as an employer that my employee, myself, was applying for unemployment insurance benefits. Getting the letter as an employer was way more troubling. Jane did the right thing. She raised the red flag on it right away, reported the fraud, 
never heard back, which that was concerning, obviously, because remember, it's coming at her from both sides. We reached out to the state on this. CDLE says, yep, they got it. They know that it's fraud, and, and they promise they are trying to get better at communicating back out with people who report in fraud. Tonight's next question comes to us from Scott. He saw Marshall's story last week about problems with the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment's out-of-state call center. He's wondering why the state doesn't just hire out-of-work Coloradans to staff those phone lines for the unemployed. Solve two problems at once. Scott, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Um, so we actually took it to the state, and they said that implementing it, at least at this point, would be kind of tricky on a widespread scale. Here's what they said. Um, CDLE said that when somebody gets to the call center calling in with a problem, they're not dealing with simple questions at that point. Uh, if it's not clear by now, this is one of the most complicated programs that the state government administers. The call center staff get trained for 12 weeks to build up the expertise necessary to work this call center. Hopefully the crush of calls has let up 12 weeks from now. State also says that one of their staffing issues is there's a good amount of turnover with call center staff because they deal with a good amount of abusive language and threats from people who are really frustrated. The state says that these days it is focused on hiring only Colorado residents. We reported last week how they had a good number of out-of-state staff. They're hiring 50 new agents every month. So if it's something that you want to tackle, 12 weeks of training to work the center, you're more than welcome to apply. Let's look at the situation with COVID in our state right now. Cases and hospitalizations appear to be plateauing. As for hospitalizations, 369 patients at last check. That is up 11 patients from the day before. You can see from the chart, the rate of decline has seriously slowed down. This time last week, we had 392 patients. Positivity rate yesterday was back over the 5% threshold at 5.3%. Our weekly average is still under that key mark of 3.4%. And here's a new number to consider. State said today that it knows of 822 cases of people who got COVID twice. This is from August 20th of last year through yesterday. These double cases represent 0.2% of the total case count. So we're talking pretty rare here. To qualify as a second infection, somebody has to receive two positive test reports that are 90 days apart from each other, spread that far apart so they can make sure that it is, in fact, two separate COVID infections and not just one really long bout with the virus. The state says that their numbers show that reinfection is rare, but it's something that can happen and it's something that they're tracking. Let's look at vaccines. 15.8% of our state's population has received the first dose of the vaccine. It's a bit over 913,000 people. More than half of them are fully immunized. We're going to tweak the language of this first dose, second dose, as that single shot J&J &J vaccine enters the picture soon. We'll just be telling you fully vaccinated or part way. So I never had the pleasure of meeting Sharon Ritzman, but a bunch of you sent me her obituary recently. She lived a life full of family adventures and exploration. And at the end of that wonderful life, her family asked that in lieu of flowers, people donate to our Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns. I can't tell you what that means and what it will mean to the nonprofits that we support together each week going forward. Sharon Ritzman, along with so many Coloradans that I've never had the pleasure to meet, contributed along the way as last week your donations topped the $3 million mark. Most recently, last week, it was $51,000 that you raised for Lincoln Hills Care so they can expand their outdoor programs for students from marginalized communities. It's such a tough time for our state. What a thing for you to be able to say that you were a part of. $3 million for Colorado small to mid-sized nonprofits. So I had a conversation with Sharon Richmond's family to thank them for her support for our Word of Thanks campaigns. And then her family helped us pick out this week's featured nonprofit, something that Sharon would have loved. We're going to try and build on your $3 million worth of good done in Colorado so far. I'll have that idea in celebration of the life of Sharon Richmond on Wednesday. The hope is that anybody who wants the vaccine will be able to get it by the end of the year. But what happens in 2022? Booster shots? We aren't going to do this whole mad rush thing again, are we? And that is no ordinary jacket. It has seen key moments in American history. Most recently, an unprecedented vaccination effort. The jacket and the women who wore it. Next.
Still too early to tell how long the first vaccines will offer us protection. A lot of public health experts think we'll probably need booster shots down the road as the virus mutates more and more, like the annual flu shot. You would hope that we would be able to handle like years two, three, and four without the goat rodeo that we've seen this time around. A short supply, mad rush for appointments. Our Steve Steger looks ahead to round two. With influenza, there's such rapid change in the virus from year to year that we have to have a new shot, uh, a new vaccine every year. Dr. Thomas Campbell with UC Health says we probably aren't in for another yearly flu shot routine with COVID-19. This is no, nowhere near the amount of variation that we see in strains of influenza from year to year. But with variations of the virus, we will likely need more than just the vaccine that's rolling out now. It's very likely that booster doses uh, will be needed um, at some frequency, um, even after the initial uh, vaccine. So what happens when we all need a shot again? Will we be in for the same kind of mad dash, prioritizing those who are at highest risk? I don't think we will have quite the supply chain, uh, you know, the, the, the imbalance that we have right now between supply and demand. Campbell says that for two reasons. One, as this vaccine rolls out for the first time, companies are scaling up. So the second time around, they'll be able to produce shots faster. Their factories will be uh, um, will be running at high capacity. Um, and so they'll be able to produce it faster. And second, there won't be such a dire demand. There won't be as much of a pressing need because the current vaccines are still highly effective against the variants. They still work well, particularly for preventing severe and critical illness. So there's still some study that needs to be done just how long immunity lasts with either either the Pfizer, Moderna, or the J&J vaccine we have on the market now. Immunity has various lifespans. You take the tetanus vaccine, that lasts about 10 years between shots, but then you've got the measles vaccine. That can last an entire lifetime. The good news is that with this shot rolling out the way it is right now, Kyle, we'll have the infrastructure in place. It'll make it a lot easier. And as you heard him say there, we're not going to have that crazy demand like we have right now. You would certainly hope uh, this is this has been uh, in, a, in a phrase uh, suboptimal. Uh, Steve, I'm not sure if you saw, but Marshall did his live sh shot from inside a mailbox. You, it appears, are still just in your yeah. home. Well, I, just, I have a bit better <laughs> microphone from here, so I decided to do it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very nice sweater, though. All right, thank you, Steve. The state completes its vaccinations inside long-term care facilities. Who took the shot and who refused it gives us an idea of things to come in Colorado. And apparently there are people picking out very specific outfits for the day they go to get vaccinated. There's a story behind this one. Next. Year into the COVID-19 pandemic, the state of Colorado is claiming victory in its effort to vaccinate long-term care residents and staff members, those facilities. The state says that every single scheduled vaccine clinic and long-term care facility has been completed. We're talking almost 73,000 residents and 62,000 employees. Now that doesn't mean that all of those people received shots, it just means that they had the opportunity. Latest numbers from the state are that 88% of long-term care residents took the shot and 66% of staff has been vaccinated. So that's a one third vaccine refusal rate among long term care staff. The state says what we are seeing now in long term care facilities is likely to be a sort of litmus test for Colorado's vaccinations as a whole. This is the true light that we have been waiting for. This is the impact that vaccines are having. It is starting to stem the tide of cases in these facilities dramatically, which means that it will start to decrease hospitalizations and deaths associated with this illness. And as we get more vaccines available across the state and everybody gets their opportunity to get this vaccine, we will see cases, hospitalizations and deaths across our state decrease. Yes, we can certainly hope so. Hey, I wonder how many people have picked out specific outfits for the day they get vaccinated. Either something that has special significance or at least something that allows you to easily roll up your sleeve. Or in the case of a woman from Golden, 
both. Suzanne Phillips Klein picked this jacket for the day that she rolled up her sleeve for the vaccine. Her family's been rolling up their sleeves, these same sleeves, for generations. It's a Red Cross jacket that her aunt, Fiona May Hader, wore during World War II. That's her with Bob Hope at a show for the troops in Iceland. And here with Kokichi Mikimoto, the man who invented cultured pearls. Vi Hader had tremendous pride in her service and this country. She was fiercely dedicated to the community of gold as a historian and activist. She passed away almost a decade ago. Her niece, Suzanne, told me that wearing her Red Cross jacket the day she received the vaccine made her feel proud to be an American. Happy Monday. It's a new week, a new month, and a new weather pattern. Sunshine today with temperatures in the 50s and will go even warmer tomorrow. Winds are increasing out of the south and southwest, so we'll see temperatures in the 60s close to 70 tomorrow afternoon and Wednesday. Now, we are tracking a storm off the coast of California that will get here eventually, but for the most part, high pressures are dominant weather feature, and that means that any incoming storms will bring mountain snow, and if that system makes it into Colorado on Wednesday, we might see a rain snow mix by Thursday. Warm and dry until then. Fair skies and 24 tonight. Tomorrow with sunshine, a high close to 60. Now we will get into the 60s on Wednesday. It's cooler Thursday with a few showers and then a warming trend for Friday. And then look at the first weekend of March, sunshine and low 60s all the way into next week. Woo, nice. Far cry from when we were freezing our beans last week. Single digit temperatures brought out the best in some of you, including a kind gesture. Never would have crossed my mind. It's the most Colorado thing we saw today. It's next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is the lengths that our neighbors will go to to care for nature. I saw this the sweetest thing. When our temperatures dropped into the single digits last month, our viewer Sherry knew that water sources would be freezing over. So she filled up like some old takeout containers with water, put them outside for the birds, and the robins were all over it. That's really cool. Never would have thought of that. It's very kind. What's the most Colorado thing you saw today? Email us pictures or send them to us on social media. Jeff Moore writes in tonight to say, I wonder if Marshall's neighbors think he's having a conversation with the mailbox. It's great. Uh, Marshall's wife uh, texted our, our staff during the show a picture of Marshall on TV talking to the mailbox and then a pan out the window to Marshall kneeling on the sidewalk talking into his mailbox. It's fantastic. Although Nora M. writes in to say that she thinks that Steve's cat beats Marshall's mailbox. It's my favorite comment in the longest time. Ron writes in about his vaccine uh, experience, said that night I had a large craving for margaritas and, sp and felt especially amorous. Hoping they offer booster shots next year. Ron, 